Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue on with our overview of metabolism and pick up where we left off, which is at the production of pyruvate, which occurs at the end of glycolysis. So recall we talked about glycolysis. It's a 10 enzymatic step pathway that converts glucose into pyruvate, technically two molecules of pyruvate per molecule of glucose. Now pyruvate is going to enter the mitochondria where we have both the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle or TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. And once there, we have this enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex that's going to convert pyruvate into the central coenzyme here, acetyl-CoA. The S right here indicates that the CoA is actually linked to the acetyl group through a sulfur atom. Okay, so that's all that means. We usually just term it acetyl-CoA. Now, pyruvate dehydrogenase not only generates carbon dioxide as a waste product, given by this green triangle, but it also generates an NADH. Remember that glycolysis per glucose generated two molecules of NADH. Well, pyruvate dehydrogenase for each of its reactions also generates an NADH okay, in the formation of acetyl-CoA. Now, acetyl-CoA is considered the central coenzyme because not only can it enter the citric acid cycle as shown right here, but as we'll see in a few minutes, it can participate in a variety of other biosynthetic pathways. And so we'll actually see how this metabolism overall is integrated. Let's first talk about the citric acid cycle. So the first reaction in the citric acid cycle is citrate synthase. So citrate synthase performs a condensation reaction between acetyl-CoA, in particular the two carbons of the acetyl group, and oxaloacetate, which is a four carbon molecule. So if we combine a four carbon molecule with two carbons from acetyl-CoA, that's gonna give us citrate, which is a six carbon molecule. Now citrate is gonna be converted to isocitrate by this enzyme called aconitase, sometimes called aconitate hydratase. Okay, but it converts citrate to isocitrate. Isocitrate is just an isomer, and so this is still six carbons. Now the next enzyme is called isocitrate dehydrogenase. Now isocitrate dehydrogenase performs what we call an oxidative decarboxylation. So not only do we generate an NADH, the red triangle, we also lose a carbon dioxide. Now if we lose a carbon dioxide, that means we're down one carbon atom. So isocitrate with six carbons, the resulting compound, I know this is not an alpha symbol, it kind of messed up, alpha ketoglutarate is a five carbon compound because we lost a carbon dioxide. Now alpha ketoglutarate will be then be converted to succinyl CoA by this enzyme called alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. Its function is actually very similar to that of pyruvate dehydrogenase, except it has a different substrate. So it's also going to perform an oxidative decarboxylation. So we get an NADH out of this reaction, and we also generate carbon dioxide as a waste product. So alpha ketoglutarate was five carbons, right? So that means if we lose a carbon dioxide, succinyl-CoA is four carbons. And in fact, from succinyl-CoA all the way through oxaloacetate here, these are all four carbon molecules, okay? So succinyl-CoA synthetase is the next enzyme. This converts succinyl-CoA into succinate. Now, what's really important here is that succinyl-CoA synthetase actually performs substrate-level phosphorylation. That's a fancy term meaning that we get ATP generation directly through an enzymatic reaction, okay? Now, technically, this enzyme actually forms GTP, okay? Um, GTP is very similar to ATP, and in fact, the GTP then can be immediately converted to ATP, okay? It's important to realize, though, that this enzyme does not directly produce ATP. It does produce GTP, which is still considered substrate-level phosphorylation, and for our purposes, that GTP is equivalent to an ATP, all right? The next enzyme here is called succinate dehydrogenase, and it converts succinate into fumarate. Now, here is an important point, and we'll see this in a few minutes as well. 
Succinate dehydrogenase is the common name of this enzyme. However, this is the same enzyme as complex 2 in the mitochondrial electron transport chain. So in the electron transport chain, we have complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, complex 4, and ATP synthase, right? Well, complex 2 is exactly the same. It's the same enzyme as succinate dehydrogenase. So these are all mitochondrial enzymes, and they all exist in the mitochondrial matrix. However, all of these enzymes are soluble within the mitochondrial matrix except succinate dehydrogenase, which is actually a membrane-bound enzyme. We go over the electron transport chain and how this works in a lot more detail in another video, but understand that this is the same as complex 2. And it actually generates what we call FADH2, which is very similar to NADH. It's slightly different, but it's still a reduced electron carrier that's going to power the electron transport chain. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. And then this fumarate is converted to malate by the action of fumarase. I don't have it shown here, but this reaction also uses water to perform the reaction. Now, fumarate, like succinate, is four carbons. Malate is also four carbons. Okay? And then malate is then converted to oxaloacetate by malate dehydrogenase. This is an oxidative enzyme, and so it's going to produce here an NADH. Okay? And then this oxaloacetate that we have can then be converted back to citrate by combining with another acetyl-CoA molecule. Again, remember oxaloacetate is four carbons. The acetyl component here is two, so two plus four is back to our six carbon citrate. Now, if we look at the enzymes within the citric acid cycle, there are three of them that produce NADH. So if we consider how many NADHs are produced per acetyl-CoA, it would be three, right? Because per acetyl-CoA that enters here, we have three enzymes that produce NADH. Sometimes you'll hear that referred to as per turn of the cycle. So per turn of the cycle is the same thing as per acetyl-CoA. There's three NADH is produced. There's also two carbon dioxides produced. Okay? So what if we consider per glucose? Right? Well, glucose produces two acetyl-CoAs. So per glucose, it would actually be double. So three times two would be six NADHs within the citric acid cycle, and two times two, four carbon dioxides. So you have to pay attention whether or not it's talking about per glucose or per acetyl-CoA, also known as per turn of the cycle. Now, important note, pyruvate dehydrogenase here is not part of the citric acid cycle. Okay? It comes before that. So we can also talk about how many NADHs and CO2s are produced per pyruvate. Okay? So per pyruvate, there's actually four NADHs. So one here at pyruvate dehydrogenase and three within the cycle. For carbon dioxides per pyruvate, there's three. One here at pyruvate dehydrogenase, two within the cycle. So per pyruvate, we have four NADHs, three carbon dioxides. So you have to pay attention here. But what if I then say per glucose, all right? If we just look at this picture, per glucose, we have two pyruvates, right? So we have to double everything. So that would actually be uh, one, two, three times two is six carbon dioxides. And then for NADHs, one, two, three, four times two is eight NADHs. But hold on, it gets even more complicated because remember, we form two NADHs in glycolysis. So per glucose, we have two pyruvates, so that's eight NADHs here, plus the two in glycolysis is 10. So two NADHs in glycolysis, eight here because there's two pyruvates, all right? No carbon dioxide is produced in glycolysis. So per glucose, we have one, two, three, times two is six carbon dioxides per glucose. Those can be common questions you get asked on an exam. Now a couple other things here before we move on. Pyruvate can actually be reversibly transaminated to an amino acid called alanine. So these are actually directly interconvertible. So if we need more amino acids, pyruvate can also be converted to alanine. But then if alanine needs to be metabolized for energy, alanine can be converted back to pyruvate, and it's through the action of this enzyme called alanine transaminase. 
Also note that several amino acids are what we term ketogenic. So if we need to metabolize amino acids for energy, some of them will be metabolized to acetyl-CoA or very related compounds. So here's a list of some of those. So the purely ketogenic amino acids, there's only two of them. Those are leucine and lysine. And then there's some that are ketogenic and glucogenic. Those are isoleucine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. So ketogenic amino acids are metabolized basically down to acetyl-CoA or its derivative acetoacetyl-CoA that we'll see in a minute, but basically acetyl-CoA. A glucogenic amino acid is metabolized either to pyruvate or any of the other intermediates in the citric acid cycle. Most of them are going to be metabolized to oxaloacetate, succinate, or alpha-ketoglutarate. There's a few exceptions, but if it's metabolized to any of those, or pyruvate, it's glucogenic. And you can see some of them here, four of them, are both, both acetyl-CoA and pyruvate or a citric acid cycle intermediate. So that's what we mean by ketogenic versus glucogenic. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, I mentioned that some of these enzymes here produce NADH. And again, remember also pyruvate dehydrogenase does as well. What happens to that NADH? Well, NADH is like a battery. And actually, the same thing is true of FADH2 here. NADH and FADH2 are like batteries for the electron transport chain. Obviously, a machine is not going to work without a battery, right, without an energy source. And that machine that I'm referring to is the electron transport chain and ATP synthase. The electron transport chain is composed of four major enzymes that are termed complex 1, also called NADH dehydrogenase, complex 2, also called succinate dehydrogenase, complex 3 called cytochrome C reductase, and complex 4 called cytochrome oxidase. And collectively, these complexes power the production of ATP by ATP synthase. And this right here is oxidative phosphorylation. It occurs in the mitochondrial inner membrane. That's where these proteins are situated. Now the NADH that's produced by any enzyme doesn't matter. It could be the two produced in glycolysis. It could be the two produced here by pyruvate dehydrogenase or the six produced in the citric acid cycle. Those NADHs go and they power complex one. Basically the NADH holds electrons that it picked up from these molecules and it dumps them off at complex one. Complex 2, which is succinate dehydrogenase, uses FADH2 to pick up electrons from succinate. Okay? Now, regardless whether you're complex 2 using FADH2 or complex 1 using NADH, once those complexes pick up those electrons, they both give them to complex 3. So complex 1 gives electrons to complex 3. Complex 2 gives electrons also to complex 3 which is also called cytochrome C reductase. Complex three then dumps those electrons down to complex four. And then complex four is going to power ATP synthase with the help of complexes three and one. Now the exact details of how they power ATP synthase is well beyond the scope of this video, but if you're interested, I do have videos where we talk about that, okay? That is oxidative phosphorylation, and that's the purpose of generating NADH and FADH2. So hopefully this video gave you a good overview of the citric acid cycle and how it fits in with oxidative metabolism in the electron transport chain. In the next video, we're going to continue looking at more metabolic pathways and see how everything fits together. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.